Hello, I'm Bronwyn Williams, and we're back with a small print. And today, my guest is Jure Moore. Would you mind introducing yourself the way you like to be introduced these days? Absolutely. So, um, Jude Moore, I'm a senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development. It's a think tank in Washington, D.C. In my previous life, I was the Minister of Works for Liberia. And that's exactly why we invited you on the show. I'm really interested in your ideas that you've been publishing and sharing on various different social media platforms and some of the papers that you've put out, particularly with regards to Africa's relationship with the various really big economic consensuses out there in the world. So on the one hand, Africa's relationship with the Washington consensus, and on the other hand, Africa's relationship with the Beijing consensus to sort of oversimplify the problem quite a lot. And I think what I wanted to start with is one of the more recent pieces that you put out with regards to how Africa should be looking at the future climate challenge based on how it was aided or not aided by the rest of the world in what happened with COVID. So would you mind taking us through some of your very high level thoughts in that regard as to what's ahead, what the reality is when it comes to Africa looking for assistance with some of the bigger global wicked challenges ahead? Again, thank you for inviting me. I follow you on Twitter, I follow you on LinkedIn, and I've seen uh, what you do. Really, really excited and happy that you invited me here. I, I think the, the way I started off with that piece was that um, very early on in human history, we sort of realized the, the value of cooperation and partnerships. And so this is something that we've done for a long time, but that every form of partnership requires a certain element of trust. In fact, um, places in Africa are called low trust societies and low trust societies end up being slightly poorer than high trust societies. So for international systems, they too require trust. In fact, the current international system that we have was built after the Second World War. It was built on the ruins of a low trust system, right, after the, the First World War. So we, and, and this trust requires us, trust then lowers the cost of, of transaction because I, your, your responses to my actions are predictable in trade, in commerce, in diplomacy, everything. And then follow on that, we have globalization where we became increasingly integrated, the weak and the strong, the rich and the poor. And, and what happens in integration is that we assume each other's weaknesses and strengths in the hope that if we are confronted with a problem, there will be a united response. At least that's what we thought. Then the pandemic. So we were faced with a global problem and the richest countries in the world decided to respond with national plans. And so there was this, first it started off with PPEs and tests. We were seeing different countries seizing planes on the runway with test equipment headed for other countries. Even in the United States, states uh, in, importing tests had to hide the test from the federal government because the federal government was seizing it. Everywhere else, it was every man for himself and God for us all. And that, for me was indicative of how the world will respond in the face of any other crisis. And now that we're facing a massive climate crisis and we're supposed to meet in November for COP26, my recommendation to African governments was, you cannot walk into this negotiations ignoring the recent past. You have to take into account how the world has responded to the COVID crisis. So those, those, those were the um, initial thoughts and comments. I thought that was a really valuable conversation to have because when we're dealing with global health crises or something like a pandemic, it only becomes resolved when the whole world is resolved. We have a globalized you know, movement of people across the world. And even if you manage to isolate yourself like a player like New Zealand or Australia has decided to do, they're only safe. They're only able to come out from the prison of their own making when the rest of the world is safe too. It makes more sense to address global problems from a global perspective, not from a local perspective. Correct. By focusing on the local solution first, you actually make your local problem worse in the long run. So there's a grand right. irony there. 
But in another sense, the climate challenge coming up ahead is even more complicated than that because it's it's also unfairly distributed across space as and as well as time. It's not just the one dynamic now because the real sort of elephant in the in the room around the climate crisis is that looking ahead, Africa, the soon to be most populous continent on the world, is going to bear the brunt of any climate change fallout, not just because it's going to have the largest amount of people that have to live through whatever happens next, but also due to the dynamics, the natural dynamics of the continent itself, how it is set up to bear the brunt of things like famines and droughts and extreme heat waves. So Africa is destined to bear the costs of what comes ahead. But if you look back in time, so much of the rewards of easy, cheap energy have already been eaten or spent by the players who perhaps are not going to share quite so much of the cost going ahead too. So now not only do we have that dynamic that we have with a pandemic, whereby it's a global problem, unless everyone acts together, it's simply not going to be solved for anyone. But you've also got a very unfair balance between risk and reward and between who's won in the past and who is going to win in the future. And I know we shouldn't mm. use any language like win and lose. And I know that a lot of the global conversations around these issues have tried to avoid those words, to avoid framing this in terms of a war and a winners and losers and to look for sort of general consensus. But by refusing to admit the, the bold truth that some individuals, some nations and some regions are going to carry more cost in terms of both social and economic terms going forward from a move towards more, say, degrowth policies and also from a move not to embracing those policies. I think to not address that by refusing to actually bring those, those truths that individuals know to light, we're not going to face the future very sensibly because if we ignore uncomfortable truths they don't disappear and this is something that we have definitely seen play out over over recent history i don't know how do you feel about that do you think that we do need to address these unequal trade-offs going ahead or are there ways that we can sort of work around it i, I so i i agree with everything you said i, I you know in at the beginning of the war on terror the way the Bush administration, and I wrote about this in the past, the way the Bush administration sold the war to the American public uh, was that we need to fight them over there so we don't have to fight them over here. I think even for a self-interested country, if you wanted to tackle the pandemic, that's the approach to take. Even if you didn't care about people over there, it is the understanding that if the problem isn't solved over there, we're gonna have to fight the problem over here. So for, for people who think like, oh, it's a selfish and self-interested thing to do, even that would mean having a global response. And, and you're right in terms of in the first time we met at the, the framework of the Convention on Climate in 1992, there were two principles established. One was that there was a common but differentiated responsibility. So there was a climate change was a man-made problem, but certain people certain places were more responsible than others. The second was that polluters pay. Those most responsible for the crisis would bear most of its cost. What we are seeing today is that those who are most responsible for the crisis, who've enjoyed the benefits and fruits of the activities that led to the crisis, want to pay the least cost. And that is where we find ourselves today. So the problem with Africa isn't simply what you highlighted in terms of the size of the population and the growing population. It's also a significant portion of that population, more than 50% is engaged in some form of agriculture. That agriculture is not um, mechanized. That agriculture is not, does not use input. It's mainly um, uh, human labor. And most of it is rain fed. So it's not irrigated. So it means disruptions in climate will have a significant and outsized impact on them. I mean, most African countries import most of what they eat, which means if there are food shortages in the future because of climate, exactly what we saw with vaccines is what will happen. Large countries will prevent the export of food. And so we are at a disadvantage on every level concerning this. And, and, and the final thing I would say on this is for some reason, 
Africans attend international forums for, for discussions and, and, and negotiations, sort of with this understanding of this, this assumption that their counterparts are going to seek the best outcomes for them. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, every country arriving there, especially the West, is going to do so looking for outcomes that are better for themselves. Look at the UK, the US, Australia, and France. I mean, these are allies. But when it was in the UK and the, and the US's interest to take the deal, the submarine deal from France, they did exactly that. And that doesn't stop them from being allies. But for some reason, we in Africa assume that the Chinese or the Europeans are going to negotiate better deals for us. I, I think at some point, there is enough in our history, in our past, in our engagement with the rest of the world to get Africans to the point where one, we recognize we are way too small as individuals to make an impact. So to continue to negotiate with the world as individuals doesn't work for us. Secondly, our strength is in numbers. So there has to be pay the cost of coordinating Africans so that there is a coordinated response, so that there's a common Africa position for some of these issues. Going back to what you were saying there, that common African negotiating position is something that like really comes across as being critical going forward. But I think the, it's also the question as to what Africa should negotiate about together. I mean, this is something mm. that the European Union has had to grapple with, actually finding a sort of a common consensus as to the position they want to take in, in various sort of geopolitical issues. And that's mm. perhaps something that we have not done a particularly good job of as Africans for Africa, as in having that that common negotiating position that we all aligned to what we want. This is a very complicated issue. And I think it's something that's worth mentioning before we go too far down that what do we actually want to negotiate for yeah. question is the fact that Africa is almost damned if it does and damned if it doesn't when it comes to the climate question. In that if nothing is done about the climate and the current trends continue, Africa is going to experience the largest fallout in terms of food security, as you've mentioned, in terms of heat, in terms of just general sort of climate migration across the continent is going to be the huge fallout over there. However, the other sort of elephant in the room that's worth pointing out is that if everything is done about climate, if the most dramatic policies are implemented by the biggest governments across the world, and that's a very big if, because as I've sort of spoken about on this show too, some of the, the largest geopolitical powers in the room perhaps are not quite aligned on those same incentives. If you start looking a bit further east to China and Russia, it might not benefit from perhaps putting as much effort into reversing some of these trends as other nations would. I mean, that's an uncomfortable sort of thing to look at. But the fact remains for Africa is that if the world shifts to a degrowth future, it does adopt very, very draconian sort of, you know, anti-carbon movements and focuses very hard on making sure that we preference sustainability over growth. Africa is also going to lose out there because Africa is a continent that requires growth. We're starting from a much, much, much lower base. Africa is not ready to talk about redistribution without some sort of growth or without some give and take from elsewhere in the world. I think that's also a point worth making, not because it's a nice point. In fact, I've read many papers coming from international bodies where they sort of try and skirt around this point. Because again, not everybody's incentives are, are aligned quite as, quite as neatly as we might like. Again, these issues have to be brought to light in order to give African leaders a negotiating position. I don't know if you agree with that because I know it is a it's not, it's not polite conversation to have, but no, no, no. pulling it out. 100%. I, I agree with that. In fact, that this is something that I have written about. And the way I see it is this. There, there are divergent needs here. In the rest of the world, and, and the only country in Africa that sort of fits that is South Africa because South Africa is a net emitter. Um. The, the, the problem is to, to shift from um, climate, uh, from polluting sources of energy to green sources of energy. In Africa, the problem is there's too little access to energy. So if Africa is going to emerge out of poverty, there has to be some form of industrialization. That industrialization has to be driven by increase in per capita consumption of electricity. So for Africa, <laughs> the, the, the problem is, is different. We need to ramp up energy use. And for now, the argument is, is there some sort of transitional role for uh, some forms of fossil fuels? For example, natural gas, which burns cleaner than, than coal, which burns cleaner than others. 
Well, in the global north, the idea here is to phase out completely. I, I just tweeted a story this morning where all of the major oil companies, um, international oil companies, have very little plans to develop their natural gas reserves in Africa. However, across the global north, they're building natural gas plants, supposedly as backup to renewable energy. So what is Africa supposed to do? Some of our colleagues at the Energy for Growth Hub have calculated that if all of the African countries, at least south of the Sahara, were to triple their energy use overnight using natural gas, it would still be less than 1% of global emissions. So the question of reduction in emissions has no place in Africa. Reduction in emissions should be among, that, that's a conversation that should occur among the world's largest emitters. And one of them, of course, is China. What China does is gonna be really, really important. I know that we have in the past sort of focused our attention on, on Western and industrialized countries, but China now is, is, is a net emitter. And so, but that emission is what powers China's growth. So there's this fear that if Africa's growth should ever get to that point, we would then contribute to this. But what exactly are African governments and people supposed to do? Are we supposed to remain the poorest people in the world and Africa will become the sacrificial lamb so that we can make our transition to net zero? We didn't volunteer for that and we're not going to accept that. So I think you're right that the cost of coordination is high. If African governments are going to coordinate around uh, common positions, then it means that there have to be significant debates within the continent itself about what those positions would be. But it is better to start doing that now, not simply because it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, look at the EU. Like you said, it's difficult to, co to coordinate you know, 54 or 48 or 49 countries around common positions, but not doing that puts you at a disadvantage. And so I think um, the final thing I would say on that is if the AU is not able to do this, then you're looking for strong leadership from the countries, the continent's largest countries, Nigeria or South Africa. The problem with Nigeria and South African leadership is Nigeria is so weak internally. What is happening in Nigeria sort of reduces its ability to act outside. South Africa has wicked weaknesses too. I mean, South Africa is going through a significant amount. South Africa is now the most unequal country in the world. It has to address that problem. And so it sort of weakens Nigeria and South Africa's ability to coordinate the continent. And so maybe uh, we're looking for a new leader to arise in Africa that can help us to coordinate. Nothing wrong with that at all. But let's go back to something you were touching on earlier about sort of China's role in the future of Africa. And as you have mentioned, energy security is critical for growth and growth is critical for Africa, where we have many, many, many people living below the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We really do need to make sure that we are preferencing raising the most vulnerable people in the planet up before we start sort of asking them to share their toys that they don't even necessarily have yet. So what's been quite interesting to observe in the last few weeks is China is stating that it's going to be pulling out of funding fossil fuel based energy developments in Africa. And China was one of the primary funders of those development projects. I know that's something you've written about, too. Maybe we can get into some of the sort of dynamics around the, the China debt versus equity deals and all the rest of it and how those deals are structured. But I think that right now, the sort of urgent issue then becomes what, where, do, where do African leaders look for funding to secure that energy future? Are there other alternatives? Is Europe getting more generous with sort of green energy investment? Or are we reaching a point where funding is also going to become more scarce as we go into these politics of scarcity ahead? I, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, up to 2019, 40, 40 to 42% 40 of infrastructure financing on the continent came directly out of African government's budgets. China was responsible for about 20 to 22% of that infrastructure financing. And we began to notice, though, that there was a decline in, in available Chinese financing for, for large infrastructure projects. And it, it appears that decline is permanent. Right? It, we're not going to see the high levels of Chinese involvement. And this question of whether Europe is going to step up or whether the United States is going to step up seems like an odd one to me. And, and I, I hope African leaders are not expecting that to happen. See, we have had a longer relationship with the West than we have had with the Chinese. And if the West had invested in African infrastructure as the Chinese have over the last two decades, there would have been no space for China when they arrived in Africa. 
China was not displacing anyone, right? In spite of everything the Chinese have done, there's still up to a hundred billion dollar gap in infrastructure financing annually. And so if China were to stop providing infrastructure financing in Africa today, there is no like for like replacement for the Chinese. I think it's important for African countries to understand this, that Europe is not going to replace the Chinese. And, you know, Europe might step up a little bit, but I, I, there's, there's no reason, there's nothing in the, in the immediate or distant past to give us the impression that Europe is going to somehow begin to spend, you know, tens of billions of dollars on African infrastructure. I, it just seems, you know, I, look, I'm, I'm looking to be proven wrong. I'll be happy if I'm wrong about this, but I don't think so. So I think you're right. The second thing is, the second danger for, for African countries around this China not financing fossil fuels, I think the Chinese said coal. I don't know if it's going to extend to gas, but there is a push across Western Europe now to force the World Bank to stop financing those kinds of projects too. So for African governments looking for financing, not only are they going to find a decline in financing from, from, from you know, China, from Europe, multilateral institutions that initially that provide finding funding for them are not going to finance those. Now, what is going to be left with Africans are two things. They either go to the market to issue you a bond debt or the private sector. Well, we have seen large private sector groups like uh, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, Harvard University, Blackstone, beginning to divest from, plant, from fossil fuels. So eventually, there's not going to be any incentives for the private sector to invest in those. And so African countries are gonna be looking at a pretty bleak future in terms of how they finance their own infrastructure, especially if that infrastructure isn't green. The problem with green infrastructure at the moment is that the power is intermittent. It's not available on demand. What happens when the sun goes down? You know, what happens when the wind is not blowing? And the technology for storage is still not cost effective. And so because of that, for African countries, green energy is not because we don't want it, it's simply because it is not fit for the need that we have at the moment. So how does Africa pay for this? You know, I, this is a question that I struggle with myself because we have the lowest savings of all regions in the world. Most times we finance infrastructure using savings. Well, if we don't have savings, it means we have to look externally for financing to be able to do this. And if the financing is drying up in all of those places, then it's really, really important for us to be able to maybe reapportion how we spend what we spend. Money is fungible. So if there's still infrastructure for which we can get financing from elsewhere, then let's direct our own financing toward the infrastructure that we can get financing from and then extract financing to the infrastructure that we can get financing from. And I think... The, the, what scares me is the conversation that we're having here is not what I hear from African leaders on the world stage. It is almost as if it's business as usual. They do not fully appreciate the changing dynamics of international relations and international economics and finance. Yeah, what you're saying there really resonates with me. And I think it leads into sort of an idea I've been toying with and that there's almost like this future of eco redlining, which is very similar to like the idea of digital redlining, right? Where, yeah, sure, we'll do business with you, but you have to sort of follow all of these loops that we set out. And I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of digital redlining, but I'll explain it very briefly for those who aren't. And that's when essentially algorithms or computer programs or, you know, data models are used to fairly exclude people from access to things like finance. So the algorithm says that, you know, you live in a poorer area, so you're going to be less likely to pay back your bond. Therefore, you know, the computer says, no, you can't get the loan. You know, you've got to, you've got to the computer says, no, it's totally fair. The same sort of thing applies to a sort of eco redlining ahead. You know, oh, you want it for, for, for dirty energy. So, you know, we can't help you. And it's not just you, it goes throughout the whole supply chain. Yeah, but if I give it to your government, what if your government spends it with this company? And, you know, you know we're trying to be good here, right? So it's the sort, of, the sort of backdoor saying no to what's actually required out there. And that sort of leads me to another question. So again, I think we're going to go through quite a lot of the problems here. I definitely don't have all the solutions. It's way above my pay grade to actually solve some of these problems. But we can at least talk about them. Because once we can articulate what's wrong, then we can find more sort of pragmatic ways ahead as to what, what actually can be done. 
So we talked about like sort of funding drying up and African leaders going to have to look towards building resilient, robust local economies, including improving savings and you know, getting, getting all, of, all, of, all of that going on there too. But there's other tricks that Africa doesn't have that the rest of the world does. And I think a lot of this conversation we're speaking about today is just the unfairness of the African situation. I think this is also a point worth noting is that over the last year, I think within the first sort of 12 months of, of COVID breaking out, sort of one in every or five out of every $10 was printed. I mean, I can't remember the statistic, but it's absolutely ridiculous, right? We have loads more dollars floating around the system today than we did a year ago. And America is able to do that because they have monetary sovereignty. And quite frankly, Africa has to accept dollars. You know, you don't really have a, have a choice in that. However, if we try and play the same tricks, if we try to print our rands, and like the rand is one of the stronger currencies in the African continent, not the strongest anymore, but one of the stronger ones, if we tried to just do the same thing, if we tried to mint a trillion rand coin, like the US is tossing around now trying to print a trillion dollar, dollar coin, no one would take us seriously. We would devalue our currency. So we can't spend our way into a Green New Deal by simply increasing money supply either. However, very unfairly, the richest nations in the world with monetary sovereignty, speaking mainly of the US now and the UK too, now that it's post-Brexit, are able to play those sorts of games to fund Green New Deals without cost to themselves. In effect, what happens is that they pass those costs onto people who have to take that currency that are not able to make their own, which means effectively, and, and that, again, I get into lots of trouble when I try to say this on Twitter, effectively, the more sort of money the US prints, the more the rest of the developing world ends up paying for a lot of those, those projects. I know the people that propose these sorts of ideas and one monetary theories don't like to talk about that sort of aspect of it. But, but you know, when you're increasing the financial side of your economy, you're increasing claims on real resources, but what you're really doing is redistributing who gets a claim on those real resources. And you can pass those claims or the costs of who, who loses in those deals through space or through time, through, through time, through things like inflation, but through space also through basically sort of financial colonization, if you want to put it in a very sort of blunt sort of way. Again, I'm not sure if you would agree with that, but I think it's worth mentioning how unfair it is that certain countries have more, if not more faith in their currency, at least the, the more sort of geopolitical force to back that up. It allows them to leverage policy in ways that is much less costly to their own populations than what African leaders, quite frankly, are going to be able to do with their own economies. I, I think, you know, that's a, a, a very important point and it's one worth considering. Mm -hmm. I have limited competence in, in monetary policy. What I do know is that with this $650 billion um, SDR issue, some countries, especially the countries whose hard currencies are in demand, are concerned about that, right? Because that increasing that supply of 650 billion in SDRs is a demand on hard currency, right? And so they're concerned about that. Similarly, by continuing to increase the monetary supply, it has to have a similar effect. And you're right, there is a premium. I mean, what happened in the first month after COVID, that January, more than $100 billion fled uh, emerging markets for the relative safety of, of Western economies. And, and so they were then issuing negative bonds, right? negative uh, rate, rate bonds. So basically people were paying the U.S. government to borrow from the, for the U.S. government to borrow from them. And so who pays for that, right? I mean, so you, you're right that we, that this is a tool that is not available to us. They have spent by 2020, they spent like $10 trillion dollars Right. And, and, and about five trillion dollars was spent in loans and guarantees and equity to the private sector across the globe. We we were not anywhere close to that because we just didn't have the capacity. What are we asking for right now? SDRs issued to Africa was supposed to be around thirty three billion dollars. So we're asking that for countries who do not require, who do not need it, to onward lend or donate that to us so that it gets up to one hundred billion. We're still begging for 100 billion when they have spent trillions, right? And so the, the tools that are available to finance ministries and central banks across the continent are definitely not the same tools available to their counterparts in the West. So yeah, there is a certain inherent, I think one of the benefits of COVID was that before COVID and all of the mess, before the unveiling, the removing of the veneer of, of, of you know, oh, everything is okay, this unfairness has always been there. It's not as if it started now, but COVID has just laid it bare 
to see how unfair everything is. Everything. I mean, just from food to vaccines, everything is unfair. And at some point, you know, there is really it's limited space for, for what African governments can actually do in the face of this. But I think the place to start, though, is a, a real politic assessment of your own position in the world. Because when you recognize what that position is in the world, then it, it changes how you see the rest of the world. I, I like to give this story of Tony Blair talking about why Britain should remain in, in, the, U, in, the, in, the, in the EU. And he was saying that, look, the, the global economy is dominated by continent-sized economies like China, like the United States, like India. You know, for, for Britain to have any influence and sit at the table with them at equals, Britain had to join with other medium-sized countries in the EU, and then the EU can sit at the table as equals with them. Well, if that applies to Britain, the total GDP of Britain is almost equivalent to the G combined GDP of Africa. What do you think it means for Africa? So at some point, the hope is that the leadership will stop the navel gazing, stop the internally focused uh, um, out outlook, and begin to think about, you know, what is best for us as a continent? Like Thirty percent of us live in landlocked countries, resource poor landlocked countries. There is no strength as individuals. So, as unfair as the world is, as 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 unequal as it is, we can begin to even the playing field by increasing our voice in international affairs. And the way we increase our voice is to speak as one. Well. That's a very good point. But now to add something more to the conversation there, what are the opportunities for Africa partnering with other countries, perhaps larger ones like India or even smaller ones like some of the developing markets in the East that face the same challenges of a growing population and, you know, unfair, all these other unfair dynamics that we've spoken about. Whereas I know that quite often the, the conversation is like, does Africa partner with Europe or with China or with America? Europe, China, and America have very different objectives. They're all aging populations at this point, right? And they all, they all, you know, redistribution and a scarcity politics actually suits them going forward. Whereas what are the opportunities for Africa forming trading blocks? That's something we haven't seen happen, mm. really, when you look at geopolitics and Africa. Africa is never a player. I mean, you read Henry Kissinger's work and Africa is basically a footnote, right? It was never rallied together to be a negotiating force. And I think there's so many shuffling and reshufflings going on at the moment with just the quads going on and the, the fallouts between the US and France. There's a lot of opportunity in this sort of, you know, reshuffling of the, the global chessboard to perhaps actually start forming some of those alliances more, more foresightedly with, with nations and regions that have the same challenges ahead, not actually divergent ones. I 100% I agree. I think this is sort of a weakness of the current cadre of leaders in Africa. The guys, after they did that post-independence um, leadership, that generation understood this, right? The whole idea of a non-aligned movement, they, they, they understood that there are certain shared uh, interests with countries in Asia, with countries in Latin America. And, but now we, we, we don't see that a lot. And I think you're right. Look, I think you can negotiate, you can collaborate with India on some things and you will diverge with India on some things, right? And, and, and just understanding that and playing that game, right after Australia and what right after the Quad was created, China proposed its own Quad, right? With Africa, Germany, and France, right? Uh, and, and for some reason, you, you're right, you don't hear of African countries you know, entering or the continent as a whole, entering into sort of arrangements like, look, on this question, we're going to stick together. On this issue, we're going to stick together. Everybody else is doing it. The US, the UK and Australia just created AUKUS, whatever that thing is, right? But they understand if they're going to protect their interests in the Pacific, they needed to do something like that. And for some reason, we're not as, as agile and we are not as flexible to create those kinds. But I think you're right. I think one beginning to look inward, beginning to um, strengthen our economies and, and take actions that will actually increase savings in the economy, make it easier for people to do business so that you can generate uh, growth in the domestic economy. Secondly, acting in concert, you know, increasingly on, on big uh, global uh, problems, acting in concert. And thirdly, forming alliances. You know, they, don't, they don't necessarily have to be permanent. They don't necessarily, necessarily have to apply to all things. But I think forming alliances, that is how 
uh, uh, small powers and weak states are able to increase the strength within the system. And so I think you're right on those three counts. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting one to see the, the various different alliances that one could put together if you thought, that, thought these things through as being a, a leader in the conversation rather than a follower. I think that's also been Africa's tragedy. If you look at geopolitics, Africa's never really interfered in the rest of the world's politics. It's always been sort of swept up in them, right? So I know that, that also sort of comes to a different way of looking at, at things going forward is to is globalization actually in Africa's best interests or is more isolationism more attractive to us? Because there's no reason why we have to do what everybody else has done. So again, I'm sure there's, you know, economists across the world are very divided on these sorts of issues. But I think it's worth pointing out that a lot of what China did is it kind of got its own house in order first. It did not care about the rest of the world for a very long time. And if you look through sort of China's history, it's always done that. It's always sort of retreated done business at home and then sort of come out into the world in a very different sort of way of, of attacking geopolitics to some of the other empires that the world is that our earth has seen. Is globalization actually working out for Africa the way the free market orientated economists would say, or should we be looking perhaps at a more domestic policies first, even a more isolationist Africa? What are your thoughts there? Again, I'm, I know there's very divergent views there, but I'm interested. No, it's to fine. It's, I, I think I think it's a very interesting conversation. I, I think that you know one of the green, the bright green spots on the continent right now is this emerging tech space and the rise of tech startups, and a lot of that has been driven by global capital. Right? It's, it's global capital that is um, uh, venture capital that is taking positions in Af African businesses. If we were closed to the rest of the world, I'm not sure that possibility would be there, especially since uh, you know, our endowment in capital is, is so low. And, and that's not, so this is not driven. So th there's a benefit to that. The second thing is that you know, the Chinese, I think what they were really good at was defining what they wanted. And I don't know if we've done that well. They define what they wanted, and so they, they decided what they would take and what they would discard. All right, and so they, China did this thing where they sent out thousands, tens of thousands of young Chinese students to learn from Germany, to learn from, from, from other parts of Europe, the United States. And I remember there was this conversation. Uh, I don't know who it was, was discussing with Deng Xiaoping and asking, like, what if they don't return? He's like, look, if one out of every hundred returns, that's great, <laughs> right? But it, it, when they sent out their young people to learn, it was in pursuit of interest that they had defined themselves, right? When they asked for assistance from Japan or from, from Germany, it was in pursuit of, 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 of goals they had set. The problem with us is that more often than not, we do not determine where we're headed. The World Bank does, the IMF does, our partners in Europe does, do. And so what happens then is if we outsource the defining of what is beneficial to us, to others, it's almost impossible that we're ever gonna achieve that. So maybe it's not just closing ourselves off to the world, it's closing ourselves off to the things of the world that we don't want, right? And being very, very disciplined about that. And I think that's what the Chinese have done and what the Chinese have done really, really well. So I, I, I don't know what, what long-term, what, what, what is best. What I do know long-term, what is what we can do is that, Everywhere else in the world, the benefits of the Green Revolution have been achieved, except in Sub-Saharan Africa. The only places in Sub-Saharan Africa where you actually see this might be, I guess, South Africa, right? Where you have industrial and mechanized farming. Yeah, pockets of South Africa. But outside of that, you know, it's, it's, it's insane how much, we, we, how much of our hard currency we send out to buy food, <laughs> right? And, 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 you know, McKinsey did this report that said that without really expanding the amount of land on the cultivation in Africa, we can actually contribute up to 20% of grains and cereals. And, and, and we haven't really tackled that. And so I think, you know, there are opportunities available on the continent and maybe as opportunities shrink elsewhere, it will force us to look inward in ways that we haven't been, been, been able to do before. You know, maybe if Nigeria no longer has oil or Nigeria's oil is no longer valuable, then the Nigerian government will invest in its best assets, which is its people, right? Maybe the Nigerian government will look at and begin to encourage the non-oil producing parts of the economy. So I don't know. My hope is that, 
good or bad, the circumstances that are surrounding this climate problem that is uh, happening around the pandemic will force African leaders, both in the private sector and the public sector, to rethink our place in the world and, and sort of turn inward, if not completely cut ourselves off from the world, but sort of begin to focus on ourselves and what we can do. I like what you're saying there, especially around the whole technology piece, like the embracing progress rather than trying to resist it and using it to increase our efficiency and our value on the international marketplace. But that brings me to another sort of question and whether we can compare and contrast Africa's future with essentially China's past as to how it's sort of pulled all of its people out of poverty in a record-breaking amount of time. The reality is China was willing to sacrifice the, the health and happiness of many, many of their people in order to you know, you know, create sort of lots of jobs, but to actually trade their labor as being quite cheap. And I don't know if there's an appetite in Africa to pass that cost onto our population. I don't see any appetite in the various different conversations I've had with economists and politicians and just people living on this continent to actually want to follow that path of being a low cost labor provider. In other words, selling our human resources because we've got lots of them for, for cheap on the international marketplace. And that was a decision that worked out very well for quite a lot of those Eastern markets. And in fact, many of the, the highest GDP economies there sort of went through that process of being sort of manufacturing labor intensive economies through that, went through the whole industrialization process on a fast track basis and managed to get out the other side with a reasonable sort of middle-class living, living of standard living at the end of it. Now, I'm not sure that that is a path that we are prepared to go through. I mean, in South Africa alone, we've got massive unemployment, but we're not really pre prepared to compromise in terms of, of labor standards as a population. We're not prepared to compromise on, on wages or on living or on working conditions in places of work and all the rest of it. And we don't seem to want to trade to that lowest common denominator. We don't want to trade on price. And I have great sympathy for that view because, you know, just because other people have done it doesn't mean that we should necessarily be prepared to sacrifice a generation or two in order to sort of make the future better. I'm also not sure that there is enough of a, as much as we talk about Ubuntu and things like that, I don't think there's that much of a collectivist instinct at scale. So we've got great collectivist instincts on small scale, but not necessarily on a large scale. We all sort of willing to take one for, for the team of the other sort of African countries living, living above the Limpopo River. We really, Let's, let's be honest, we don't really have that mindset that will allow us to sort of take that collective knock for a, for a collective future. Maybe I'm just talking as a complete observer here, but again, why should we have to sort of trade on labor? Why can't we trade on sort of quality of human resources rather than quantity? And the only really way to do that is to embrace technology and that gray or whatever sort of economy you want to term it in terms of technology and progress. Again, I'm not sure how much you agree with there. Do you think there's an appetite for, for playing the Asian game or not? You know, part of the thing also is like, if we step back and look at everyone else who's come through this, the first place it begins, and I know it sounds cliche, but this is an indispensable piece of that is the, is the quality of leadership. Because someone has to convince the people that this is worth doing. And a politician who is only concerned about winning the next election is in no position to impose any pain on the people, right? So because of that, it's almost as if the incentives of what Africa needs and what its politicians want are misaligned. And so it's hard for people to do any long-term planning or to ask people to make any sacrifice whatsoever. Well, countries that have actually asked the people to make sacrifices have not actually delivered. Because whether we like it or not, Robert Mugabe has demanded significant sacrifices of the Zimbabwean people. What did they get in exchange? At least Paul Kigami has demanded a lot of the Rwandan people, but at the very least, he's offered something in return for that. What do we get in Eritrea for the amount of sacrifice that the leadership there has demanded of the Eritrean people? Nothing, right? And so I believe that maybe by use of force or, or persuasion, it is possible to, to, to you know, ask our population to make some sort of sacrifice, but there has to be some tangible results of those sacrifices. And, and I don't know if we, we've seen them. On the question of whether we can trade our cheap labor, the problem is, you know, a colleague of mine here at CGD did a research that showed that, you know, to be competitive for labor, you have to match Bangladesh. And most countries in Africa do not match Bangladesh. And the problem is because first, the high cost of food, since most of the food is imported. 
In Nigeria, for example, the average family spends like 57% of their household income on food. Unless That's you can drive point. that, unless you can drive that below 10%, then industrial labor is not cheap because if people have to spend so much on, on food, then there's a certain price you have to pay for people working in factories that, you know, it's just not competitive compared to other places. And so we come back to this question that the trajectory, the convergence from low income to high income has followed this path. Agriculture becomes really productive. It drives down the cost of food, but it also creates excess labor. That excess labor then transitions into manufacturing, into factories, right? Now, for us, maybe that manufacturing may not be in textiles, but it might be in adding value to the agricultural products we produce. And it's, 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 it's most times when African governments and, and in the pop, public sector thinks about agriculture, it thinks about food security. But agriculture is the first step in industrial policy. You need to drive down the cost of food so that labor becomes cheaper. So maybe I think there will be pockets across the continent that might be able to be more attractive. What I do know is that there is an opportunity. Every time China runs into energy problems and Chinese factories have to shut down, every time the problems are Chinese ports, it creates these gridlocks in global uh, logistics. So there is an appetite to shift some of that value chain away from Asia to some other parts of the world. Now, you know, where else? Maybe Latin America, maybe Africa. Can we position ourselves to be, not like we want to replace China, but to give resilience into global value chains, we need to diversify our sources. And, and for some reason, it doesn't seem to be like we're taking a, a, advantage of this. Morocco is. I know Ethiopia was trying to do that before the, you know, you know, descended into chaos. So I, I, I think there are significant crises and problems and challenges, but in the midst of all of them, there are still opportunities for us as a continent. And, and, and maybe if we get the leadership we deserve, we might be able to face these, face these, uh, these problems. You know, you know, maybe I should run for president. Definitely. <laughs> There's definitely places to add value to the global supply chain. That's that's the question. We've got to come with a valuable proposition. You have to be that's selling correct. something that someone else is not doing for greater value. That does not necessarily mean that you have to be selling the cheapest item in the room, but it has to be have comparable value. I think that's also where a lot of these conversations get bogged down is to play the sort of the lowest price game, whether you're looking at it from a marketing perspective in the FMCG field or in the global trade field. That's not necessarily the, the greatest proposition to offer to your populations. Because again, we have to realize that as much as you talked about politicians giving people what they want, because we have democracy in Africa, you have to play along with that as being almost a constraint. I know not all of African countries are democratic and there are many flawed democracies, but we have opted for a certain degree of freedom that a lot of the Asian miracles chose to let go. The bargain there that was given to a lot of those populations was you give up quite a lot of your social freedoms, but in exchange, we're going to increase your standard of living over time. And that, that bargain has not necessarily been made explicit to African voters as to what do you actually want more of right now. And given obviously Africans horrendous history in terms of colonization and all the rest of it, I think a lot of populations have erred on the side perhaps of freedom that is very good from a social perspective, but has also meant longer term sacrifices on the economic front in terms of the speed of growth in certain markets. I've had several of these conversations and it's made me very uncomfortable to actually look at the data as to what's gone on. There was a book that I read, I forgot the title, that actually looked at democracy and freedom in Africa from an economic perspective. And the authors were coming at it from a very libertarian free market perspective. But even given their own data, they were unable to make a convincing case that democracy was maximizing utility for the average African citizen. It seemed to be that the countries that had done the best over time had some sort of a hybrid model going on, sort of some, some degree of less than perfect economic freedom, which is, again, very, very uncomfortable to look at. But if you also compare it to what's happened in the East, none of those markets have been necessarily completely free on both perspectives. But then again, I've also spoken to like Perth Toll, who's put together her freedom index. And of course, generally, economic and social freedom do train together. And that's the story that we want to believe. But where are we necessarily going wrong? I don't know if you have a view on that. It's such a, it's, it's again, such an uncomfortable question to unpack. But the actual numbers 
do not make comfortable reading. It's one worth having. It's a conversation worth yeah. having because all of the, even the richest countries in the world began significantly on free. We keep talking about the United States during its industrial past. You know, black people were slaves in this country. I mean, that's where it started, uh, planting cotton. And that cotton helped create, in terms of wealth creation and capital creation in the United States. And then we go through this period where black people are second-class citizens in this country and are forced to work in these factories and work in these places. You know, so the idea that, oh, it begins with free market, free for whom? Right. I mean, a significant portion of the wealth that comes into Liverpool and comes into parts of the UK comes from the Caribbean and the sugarcane plantation that slaves were working on there. So it's how do you how does a country create enough wealth to be able to how did China get all of that savings? Well, if you force everybody to have a single kid, you know, there, there's going to be a significant amount of savings. And you have to remember the Great March. Millions of Chinese. So the, if we want to interpret Chinese uh, um, growth as, oh, what happened in the last 20 years, that's pretty, pretty unfair. So it brings us to this point now that we have, I mean, we can go back and undo our past and we can undo the present where we're no longer democratic countries. One of the, the, the important points for, for economic growth is, is political stability. You know, the, the capital, they say, is a coward. It requires a certain amount of certainty and stability. That's why Rwanda will grow faster than Burundi. And, and, and our democratic process introduces a certain amount of uncertainty about what happens. Mago Foley comes to power in, in Tanzania and he's reviewing every deal that has been signed before him, right? Right now in Zambia, right now in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But these are the weaknesses that come with this form of government. And for most Africans, they will probably take those weaknesses above the one man rule, right? I mean, so, and this is where we are. Yeah. So I think what, what is required now is African thinkers, African economists, African philosophers to think through what this means for us and how we can forge a future out of these, these circumstances since we're not going to materially change them. I don't think any African country is going to be like, yeah, we take the strong man, you know, you know, no. I mean, you know, it's so I, I, I understand that, you know, that there's good, it is an uncomfortable conversation to have of whether we make a trade off between. But that's what the Chinese are offering. The, 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 the centerpiece of China's model is not personal freedom. It's not human rights. It's economic rights. We're going to provide you economic opportunities and it's not going to be based on human rights. And for African countries who are looking at China and seeing the spectacular success and how many people they've brought out of poverty, it is a very attractive proposition, especially to strong men across the continent, that this might be what works for us and that you know, we're not going to become Sweden, maybe at best Turkey. It's, it's not necessarily the attractive offer when you look at the, the fine print, the sort of terms and conditions that Absolutely. come along with that. And I think that oh, yeah. that's really what it comes down to. There's a cost to, to all of these policies. And what, where do your values lie? What do you really want? And that's why when it comes to the sort of cheap labor question, when it comes to the speed of economic growth, maybe we have to accept a slightly slower trajectory in exchange for having more freedom and a greater quality of life, you know, for, for every generation, not just in the generation in the future, once we've sort of arrived, assuming all these plans go together. And of course, that leaves aside the practicalities of the fact that Africa is a fragmented continent. It's not a single party state like China, you know, so you've got a, you've got a lot more players in the game that, that add a lot more uncertainty to that equation. But again, uh, a very uncomfortable conversation, but thank you for having all these uncomfortable conversations with me. So we sort of aired all the, the dirty laundry, all the, the unspoken economic conversations and come to various different it's... conclusions. <laughs> and no, but thank you again for, for having me. I think, um, I think this is what needs to happen and, and for this to happen out in the open. And, and, and that I hope you know, that we can use our channels and, and the, the spheres of influence we have to make this count to the people who are most able to take the kinds of decisions and choices that will help the continent to be able to negotiate the future we face. And, and it's not an easy future, but I like to think that there's still opportunities, even in the midst of those challenges.
there's so much to be optimistic about, but first step to optimism is to be pragmatic. You've got to understand the world the way it is in order to take the, your best step going forward. So if we can do nothing else with these conversations, we can at least lay all the cards on the table and leave the next generation of leaders to hopefully make the best choices for themselves and for their people, ideally. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show here with me. Where can people get hold of you if they want to work with you or continue the conversation? And of course, if you prefer not to be found, go for it. Tell us. Not, oh, tell us please. I'm, I'm on Twitter at, uh, at, you know, at Jude.more. And Jude is G-Y-U-D-E, that M-O-O-R-E. I'm on LinkedIn. I work at the Center for Global Development, at CGD, CGDEV.org. And uh, again, thanks for having me and look forward to chatting more. Thank you very much.